student colloquium, colloquium um, series presentation. I am Dom Gallo and I'm gonna be the faculty moderator this afternoon. We are pleased to welcome all of our virtual attendees, including School of Education faculty, staff, and students, the university body at large, community members, and partner associations, among others. The Doctoral Student Colloquium Series offers School of Education doctoral students an opportunity to share their original research and learn from their peers, faculty, and staff. Each month, one EDD and one PhD student presents their research at the colloquium, which is normally offered both on campus at Drexel University and online through Zoom. However, due to COVID-19 global pandemic, all colloquium events for the 2021-22 academic year uh, will be held virtually through Zoom. These sessions help doctoral students to connect with each other and develop peer, a peer community that is invaluable in supporting their journey uh, in the program. Each doctoral student presenter is also asked to write a research brief that relates to his or her presentation, uh, which is then included in an edited publication titled Doctoral Student Research Briefs, published on the School of Education's website. The research brief is a way to disseminate our doctoral students' research as shared in the colloquium in a concise format with relevance to education. Each presenter uh, today will be, will be provided with 20 minutes to share their research. We will then move on to questions and answers following each presentation. Uh, I would ask that you please save your questions for the end and you are welcome to uh, type your questions in the chat area of Zoom or use your mic to ask questions. Our first uh, presenter uh, and speaker today is uh, uh, Elena Black, who is a PhD student in the School of Education. Elena's research foci uh, include uh, the learning sciences, specifically mind, brain, and education science, online learning, second language teaching and learning, higher education, and instructional design. She holds a bachelor's degree in Spanish from the University of Iowa and a master's degree in teaching English as a second language from St. Cloud State University in Minnesota. Uh, her master's thesis, Second Language Listeners, Metacognitive Strategy Use, explored the relationship between university level English language learners, metacognitive awareness, and their listening comprehension and growth. Elena has facilitated online professional development events for international English teachers, taught English as an additional language and English for academic purposes to adults and post-secondary learners in the United States, in Brazil, and online, and worked as a professional academic advisor at several colleges and universities in the United States. Today, Elena will be speaking about Neuromyth awareness and brain based knowledge among academic advisors and academic support personnel. Thank you for that uh, warm introduction. Um, I am really happy to be here with you all today and um, talking about neuromyth awareness and brain-based knowledge among academic advisors and academic support personnel. So this topic is um, central to my own research agenda as a PhD student. Uh, and it's also particularly interesting for me given my background as a professional academic advisor. So I'm really excited to be able to share the current study with you all. But before we dive into that, it is important to cover some of the foundational concepts to understand the motivation behind the study and its importance. So when we talk about neuromyths, we're really referring to false beliefs that are often associated with education and learning. And these beliefs stem from misunderstandings or oversimplifications or misconceptions of information from neuroscience and information about the brain. 
Some examples of the most prevalent neural myths include that we only use 10% of our brain, that learners learn best when they receive information in their preferred learning style, such as visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, and that some individuals are right-brained while others are left-brained, and it's these differences that can help explain differences that we see among learners. There has been a good amount of research exploring this awareness over the past 15 to 20 years, and the majority of that has focused on the K-12 realm. So these studies have found that neuromyth belief is um, quite prevalent among K-12 teachers and pre-service teachers, meaning that there is a relatively low level of awareness about neuromyths. Similar findings have been seen in higher education faculty, administrators, and instructional designers. And recent research is showing that there is still a widespread belief in neuromyths among educators across all levels and contexts. Some research has also explored the factors that are associated with awareness. Um, and these studies have found that general knowledge about the brain and professional development, as well as reading journal articles about neuroscience or psychology um, or mind, brain, and education science have actually been shown to be predictors in neuromyth belief. So interestingly, some of this research is showing that engaging in these activities is actually predicting belief in neuromyths rather than increasing awareness of these myths. So some of you might be wondering, you know, in the grand scheme of things, does this really matter? Do individuals or instructors or educators' beliefs and awareness about the brain and about learning um, really matter? And do they really warrant our attention right now? And for me, the short answer is absolutely. Um, it does matter. And I think that there are a number of reasons for this. So, Educators' um, conceptualizations about knowledge can influence their practice, and this pedagogy can in turn influence learners' beliefs because this has the potential, uh, so this potential, this has the potential to be positive, but it also has the potential to be negative. Uh, so I believe that virtually all educators uh, want to do whatever they can to help students grow and learn. And this desire is, I think, what brings many people to education and to the profession. And so um, I also think it's one of the reasons that many of us are here in this room today. Neuromyths can sometimes seem like promising explanations for things that we think we see going on in the classroom, um, and they often form the basis for many approaches or programming or even policy recommendations, which can be expensive and time consuming. And they can also drain the valuable resources that exist that could have been put towards implementing evidence-based practices instead. So um, another reason that this is really important is that um, Belief in neuromyths and um, awareness, uh, a lack of awareness of neuromyths can have potential harm. So they can sometimes promote fixed mindsets and even cause cognitive overload, uh, both of which have been shown to really hinder learning. So in short, belief in neuromyths can do actual harm rather than simply being you know, something that's benign. So it's really crucial that we do raise awareness of these myths. But I think at this point, it is also important to clarify that um, the importance of exploring neuromyth awareness and knowledge about the brain and evidence-based practices is not to disparage anyone about their beliefs or to try to prove that someone is wrong about something. Rather, it's an opportunity for us to assess current knowledge and explore ways that we can raise awareness moving forward, thanks to the insights that we've gained from neuroscience and psychology in recent years. All right, um, so 
Uh, my title, uh, the title of my talk is about academic advising and academic support services. And you might be wondering how all of this connects since these topics seem particularly relevant for instructors. And that's what most of the research has focused on. But academic advisors and academic support personnel work very closely with students on issues around academic engagement, studying and completion of courses and their program of study. They also have the potential to influence students' self-perceptions and mindsets. Research has actually shown that academic advisors are crucial components of students' academic experience, and they can influence um, a variety of things, including students' development of self-efficacy and study skills. Academic support personnel are also um, often referred to and represented across campus as being the quote unquote experts in terms of studying and learning. And so the recommendations that they uh, provide to students and the approaches they model do carry significant weight. So despite all of these um, factors, like I said, little evidence, little research to date has actually looked at this population's um, awareness of neural myths and evidence-based practices. So this brings me to the current study, uh, looking at this population specifically. This study is being led by Drexel University's Education, Learning, and Brain Sciences Research Collaborative. It's an international explanatory sequential study that is currently underway, and it's being led by um, quite a large research team. So I wanted to take uh, just a minute to thank Dr. Betts, eLabs, and the entire research team for your collaboration on this project and for being, inviting me to be a part of it. All right, so the purpose of this study is to examine academic advisors and academic support personnel's awareness of neuromyths, general knowledge about the brain, and evidence-based practices. The study also seeks to uh, learn more about the professional development that they have attended between March 1st, 2020 and October 1st of 2021, so really during the height of the pandemic and the relationship between using evidence-based practices with advising in terms of studying and learning. And finally, the study uh, looks to explore the interest levels that advisors and academic support personnel have in knowledge about the brain, as well as how they perceive the higher education landscape post-pandemic. So the population for the study is squarely in the higher education realm. Specifically, we looked at academic advisors and academic support personnel in two and four year public, private and for-profit institutions of higher education, both in the US and globally. And um, we, um, as you can see, we did include uh, professional academic advisors and academic support services personnel, as well as administrators um, of these arenas. So like directors or associate directors of academic advising offices or academic support offices. We also included faculty who have um, assigned academic advising responsibilities. The survey itself is comprised of five sections. The first section includes 27 questions about um, the brain and neural myths. The second section includes 24 questions about evidence-based practices. The third section looks at studying and learning practices, principles, and strategies, including how participants learned about those strategies. The fourth section looks at the professional development that participants have engaged in. And the last section covers some demographic questions and professional background questions. The survey uses a Likert scale. And for the first two sections, the available options are correct, incorrect, and unsure. So an example survey question um, or survey item from the second section is focused attention is essential for learning new information. So this is a factual statement and participants are given the option on the survey to select correct, meaning they agree that this is a factual or correct statement or they could select incorrect, which would mean that they think this is a false statement. They also have the option to select unsure. 
Previous studies um, on this topic have often used a true, false, I don't know scale, um, but this specific survey instrument went through an extensive pilot study, and as a result of that pilot, the options were adjusted to correct, incorrect, and unsure. So the survey launched in late October of 2021 and was open through the end of December. We used a convenience and snowball sampling approach. Uh, so we outreached to the Association of Continuing Education members, as well as our personnel contacts in higher education um, from across the country and around the world. We shared the study with them and we asked that they uh, share it with their networks. So in total, we have 105 surveys that met the criteria for inclusion, and those are going to be analyzed soon. And the second part of the study is on um, focus groups. So the survey asked participants if they were available and interested to participate in a follow-up focus group. And so those uh, focus groups will be conducted with those participants to really learn more about the professional development that they um, were engaging in, as well as get their perceptions about the higher education landscape post-pandemic. As I mentioned, the study is currently underway and the data analysis plan is outlined here. So Qualtrics and SPSS will be used to analyze the quantitative survey data. Means and medians will be looked at for each group. And then we will also um, make comparisons across demographics. And if there are significant differences in groups, then we'll also look to make comparisons across those groups. And then the qualitative data is uh, from the focus group will be coded analyzed using in vivo. And so the term, in terms of the significance of this study, um, as a pragmatic scholar, I think that this uh, study has the potential for really great significance um, that really can only be fully realized through the combination of both the quantitative survey data and the qualitative follow-up focus groups. And I think that uh, student learning and success is influenced by a great number of factors and numerous people. But to date, research has really focused primarily on instructors. And these studies are definitely important and much needed, uh, but we also need to look at the broader picture to understand the great variety of forces that are contributing to student learning and things that we haven't necessarily explored before. So this particular study will address that by looking at academic advisors and academic support personnel's awareness and knowledge. Um, and as I mentioned, this is all really essential because these professional staff members work very closely with students and they do have the potential to make an enormous impact on them and their learning. This is also important to keep in mind because in recent years, higher education institutions have begun placing more emphasis on academic advisors and academic support personnel in terms of their role in retention and student success efforts. Another reason that I think this study is, um, has the potential for so much significance stems from my own personal experience as an advisor. So I can only speak for myself here, um, but being on the front lines as an academic support uh, personnel or as an academic advisor, it can be sometimes very challenging to be aware and remember the true impact that you are actually happening, having. And so raising awareness of neuromyths um, and evidence-based practices, I think might be help professional staff members recognize their true power um, that they have and help them feel a greater sense of impact in their everyday work when it can sometimes um, be hard to remember that big impact that they actually are having. All right, the um, eLabs at Drexel is um, currently putting on this study, as I mentioned, and they are actually in the process of um, executing five international studies on this subject. So the study I just talked about with academic advisors and academic support personnel is one of these five, and the other four look at different populations. So although the data from the academic advisor and academic uh, support services personnel study is not yet available, I am very excited to be able to share some preliminary findings from one of these international studies. And specifically, this study explored higher education faculty, instructional designers, and professional development administrators. 
So this uh, study specifically had 304 completed surveys that were included for the data analysis. The first portion, again, assessed neuromyths, uh, neuromyth awareness and general knowledge about the brain. And in this section, awareness of these items ranged from 21% to 96%. Um, so here are a few examples of items from this section of the survey. And we can see the first item, for example, that individuals learn better when they receive information in their preferred learning style is a neuromyth. And 40% of instructors, 61% of instructional designers, and 44% of administrators were aware that this is a neuromyth. The second section looked at awareness of evidence-based practices. Here, we can see that the awareness levels or correct responses ranged from 34% to 100%. So we can see that in general, compared to awareness of neuromyths, there was greater awareness of evidence-based practices overall. Um, and again, here are some of the items that are included in this section of the survey. Item two, for example, that uh, the statement that multitasking increases productivity is um, an incorrect statement, and 78% of instructors, 85% of instructional designers, and 80% of administrators were aware that this statement is incorrect. So this is a really promising finding and suggests that there is a high level of awareness um, about this item. The third section of this survey looked at instructional practices. And here we can see that almost 90% of participants in the study either currently use or have used active learning in the past. About 85% have used scaffolding and low stakes assessments. Nearly 75% have used backwards design. Um, so these numbers are, are very promising and um, suggest that many in this study either currently use or have used these practices. It is interesting to note, however, that there are um, some participants who are unfamiliar with certain practices. Um, for me, the things that stood out were universal design for learning, which can promote um, inclusive classrooms, and then the 20% of participants who um, were unaware of retrieval practice, which is really essential for learning. And finally, the last item on this list is um, a practice that's actually not rooted in an evidence-based practice, but instead in a neuromyth. And we can see that 60% of participants reported using this strategy in their practice, um, which is a pretty significant um, amount of, of folks using um, teaching to learning styles in their practice. This section also looked at how participants learned about the practice. And a really interesting finding is that we can see many of these principles are being learned during graduate education. But professional development is also another important influence here. The column on the uh, left looks at pre-pandemic professional development, and the column on the right is showing the um, professional development participants engaged in during the pandemic. So it's really interesting to see that a significant or a high number of these practices were learned um, in professional development prior to the pandemic. And there was a much lower percentage of awareness coming from PD that um, participants engaged in during the pandemic. We can also see that colleagues Online resources, books, and articles were um, reported as playing an influence on um, how in participants learned about these practices or strategies. And then finally, um, this last row here uh, provides some really great insight into how participants are learning about the learning styles approach. So here again, we see that 36% of participants learned about this during their graduate education, and 30% of participants learned about this approach from professional development that they engaged in uh, prior to the pandemic. So I think that this is a really interesting finding and might speak to some of the previous research which has shown that engaging in professional development um, is associated with belief in neuromyths, because if the professional development is teaching about learning styles, which is a neuromyth, it would make sense then that that is associated with that belief. 
All right, so as I mentioned, there are some um, implications for research and practice that stem from the academic advisor and academic support personnel study. Gaining insight into this population's awareness and knowledge is really a crucial first step in understanding the current landscape and exploring ways to raise awareness moving forward. It also has uh, practical implications for academic advisors and academic support personnel that can help them in their practice working with students. The five studies being led by eLabs on this subject together also offer an enormous amount of insight into the broader landscape that will help us understand more than just instructors awareness, um, but really the awareness and beliefs of many, many individuals across the higher education landscape. So I'm fortunate to be working on several of these studies and I'm very excited to see the, the findings come in from all of these studies. And I think that the, this broader knowledge base will uh, greatly improve our current understanding of neuromyth awareness and evidence-based practice awareness across higher education. And this in turn will help us understand how we can move forward in order to increase awareness more broadly and ultimately improve students' experiences and success. So here are the references that I cited. And I just wanted to thank you all so much for uh, being here today and for your feedback. I also wanted to thank Dr. Betts, eLabs, and the research team, again, for your collaboration on the study. And of course, thank Cohort 7, my Sisters in Scholarship, for all of your support throughout this journey. So at this time, I um, would love to welcome any questions or feedback that anyone has. I just wanted to thank uh, Elena for the presentation. And um, there is already a, there was a question or is a question, I believe, uh, in the chat from Christopher Harden. Uh, Christopher, do you want to just ask the question or should I read it? Either way. I'll read it. You can All right. read it. Okay. Uh, uh, Christopher asks, uh, does your study on awareness of neuromyths find academic advisors may need training about the brain and learning style? So um, that's a that's a really great question and something that I'm interested in in seeing. We don't have the results yet from the academic advisor study, so we don't necessarily know what their levels of awareness are. But I think more broadly, um, looking at the landscape in general and what we know about K-12 instructors and higher education faculty and instructional designers, it seems like there is a lower level of awareness than what we would like to see. So I'm anticipating that similar findings will um, be found with the academic advisors. So of course, greater awareness about neuromyths and about um, evidence-based practices are warranted, but I don't think that this is necessarily something that's unique to academic advisors or academic support personnel. Does that answer your question? Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions? Hey here. Hi, Elena. Um, I just want to say great job. And um, I was a, a high school educator for a couple years, and I was thinking about or wondering if any of your participants actually overlapped in their roles, like maybe they were an academic advisor, but also served as an administrator. Mm -hmm. um, and if so, what did that look like in the context of the study? Yeah, thanks. That's a really great question. Um, I think you're, you're spot on there. So the higher education landscape is really, um, it, it varies broadly from institution to institution and even within institutions. And oftentimes folks are wearing a lot of different hats or even you know, working at multiple institutions in different roles. So of course there's um, certainly the possibility for this overlap to happen. Um, and for someone to be you know, both an academic advisor and um, maybe working in academic support services. So one thing that um, we did on the study um, which I think can help address this is to allow participants to self-select their role so they could pick the option that really uh, most closely represented their, their primary role. But of course, there is still bound to be some, some fuzziness there between categories. They self-identified. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a question?
Okay. Um, well, again, I want to thank Elena for this great presentation. Um, and I'm sure that she would be uh, happy to take questions should some other ones come up uh, in a little bit. Okay, so our second uh, speaker is Vanessa Aird, who is an alum of the School of Education's EDD program. Vanessa has worked in the field of education for over two decades and spent her most recent years serving as Dean of Students within the independent school system. Beyond the school building, Vanessa is the founder and creative director of Harmony Dance Academy, uh, an an um, and profit organization uh, that uh, provides mindful dance programming to under uh, d underserved uh, communities. Uh, she believes part of her life's work is to aid youth in reaching their full potential by first gaining a better understanding of self all through the power of dance. As such, Vanessa's research focuses on the impact of, that dance can have on the emotional well-being of young women uh, in her homeland of Grenada, uh, as well as the need to create a safe place for them to express themselves. Uh, Vanessa successfully defended her dissertation in December of 2021 and is looking forward to expanding her research throughout the Caribbean. Today, Vanessa will be speaking about dance as therapy in Grenada, the intersection of gender, education, and crisis. Uh, thank you, uh, Vanessa. Uh, it's all yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here. Um, as mentioned, my dissertation focused on dance as therapy in Grenada, the intersection of gender, education, and crisis. And I think it's important to start um, just by saying that as a Grenadian woman myself, as the founder of HDA and doing this work on the island for some years, uh, when it came time to pick a dissertation topic, you know, they our wonderful professors are encouraging us to do something that is that we're really passionate about. You're spending a lot of time in this work. And so my topic came fairly naturally. Um, it was really clear to me uh, how I could help my country in a very unique and tangible way. And so it's very dear to my heart. Um, and I am excited to share it with you. So let's start with an introduction. So whether it's grappling with gender inequality, economic instability, or natural disasters, or most recently a global pandemic, Grenadian women are no strangers to crises. As a result, they are constantly navigating through barriers that can contribute to emotional distress. Fry reminds us that women of color often stand at the intersection of multiple barriers, experiencing combined effects of racial, gender, ethnic, and other forms of bias while navigating systems and institutional structures in which entrenched disparities remain the status quo. And Grenadian women are no exception. The purpose of this research was to explore the role of dance as therapy in the lives of young women in Grenada. And while this study uses dance one country's as the context, the ultimate goal is to generate recommendations that will be of interest to dance therapists, educators, and policymakers more generally throughout the Caribbean. This study is significant as there's an undeniable need to better understand treatments and interventions that appeal to the interest of young women, and dance is one of them. Yet access in schools and in underserved communities in general continues to be a barrier. Piatoria calls for more studies to be done on the effects of dance and movement programs, resulting in sustainable program, programming. And this study was an answer to that call. The research questions, the ever evolving research questions. The first, what challenges do young women in Grenada face, particularly in terms of social stigmas, gender inequality and discrimination. Second, what role does dance play in the lives of young women in Grenada, both in and out of school, 
particularly in terms of managing emotional wellness. And three, how has COVID-19 impacted young women's relationship to dance? And how has this impacted their sense of emotional wellness? So the literature review that informed my study consisted of three streams. The first being gender inequality in education with a focus on the Caribbean. And this provided a historical context of what gender inequality looks like within schools, as well as the government's response and their role in taking responsibility for it, as well as the remaining challenges that the country continues to face in this way. The second, youth and emotional distress with a focus on West Indian experiences. We took a look at discrimination, parenting style, serial migration, as well as cultural stigma and norms, and how they affect youth growing up in Caribbean households. And last but not least was stream three, the effects of movement and mindfulness, or dance as therapy. And this took a look at the role of dance, mindful practices such as yoga and meditation and their effects both in and out of the classroom. For this study, a narrative research design was utilized with a focus on Black feminist thought. A qualitative study in nature. And when qualitative research, research and Black feminist thought come together, a methodological practice that works increased the level of understanding among and between researchers and participants emerges. Ultimately, my goal is and was for those Black women, just like me and the participants in this study that have felt alone, unseen and unheard to see and hear themselves in this work. The ability for these young women to share their experiences and stories firsthand was truly at the core of this study. A little on the site population and access. So Harmony Dance Academy, which would be referred to as HDA for the purposes of the study and this presentation, was the site for this study. HDA takes place in Grenada approximately four weeks during the summer months when students are out of school. We have approximately 250 student alumni and over 25 former teachers. And so from that population, we focused on former students and teachers from ages 18 to 30 with a total of 10 participants in the study. And access was granted due, due to the existing relationship between myself and participants. It's important to note though, that there were many, many iterations of this study due to the COVID-19 pandemic. At first, because of restrictions, I wasn't able to travel, or at least so I thought, I wouldn't be able to travel to Grenada in time to conduct my research. However, due to the fact that I actually had to gain IRB approval in Grenada as well, during that time, uh, the restrictions were lifted. So I was actually able to go to Grenada. And while I still had to conduct um, the interviews via Zoom, it was so great to be home, to be breathing the air, the same air as the participants. I felt more connected to them. And in turn, I think they felt more connected to me. And so the research methods for this study consisted of a pre-questionnaire, focus groups, and we held two. We held a pre-focus group, and then there were individual interviews, and then we came back together again in order to take a look at the emerging themes for me to gain feedback from the participants. And so their feedback was really, really invaluable even after the initial data collection process. So as I mentioned, there were 10 participants in total all of them being born and raised in Grenada. They all attended primary, which we call elementary school, as well as junior high school, and most of them even high school on the island. They range from ages 18 all the way to 30, and they were all given a pseudonym in order to protect their confidentiality. So let's get to the heart of the study, or what I like to call the heart of it, which is the findings, the themes, what, what did we learn? What did this 
uh, the participants have to share. And the first theme that emerged during the data analysis process was being silenced. It became very clear that the participants felt like they didn't have a safe space in which they were heard. And it started, or they reported that it started at a very young age. For example, Vero shared, in my high household, I couldn't express any of this. Once the adult said something, you couldn't contradict them. You can't answer them. You can't go against what they say because they're the adult. No matter what they say, they're right. And so whether it was in the household or even in school, most of the participants reported that they felt silenced by in some way, shape, or form. And it had an emotional impact on them. Vero continued by sharing, I couldn't speak up in situations. Like I didn't have a voice. It made me not respect myself. And at one point in time, I didn't love me. I didn't accept me. I look at me and say, okay, well, she said I was stupid, so maybe I am. She said I was ugly, so maybe I am. Being silent can lead to depression. And so we see that there's a clear connection between being silenced and the emotional wellness of participants. The second emerging theme kind of on the other side of the of the coin is finding voice. And this is where participants began to share how the role of dance played in their lives, the role of mindfulness, being part of HDA, and how it really had an impact on their emotional and mental well being. Let's look at Vera once again. She stated Dance is my safe haven. All the emotions, all the judgments, insecurities, Everything that I'm being faced with from the outside, it all goes away. When I'm dancing, everything in the world is fun, joy, and peace. Dance is my escape. It gave me my voice. And so whether participants were sharing about their transferable skills, because many started as a student and progressed to be a teacher in the program. And so they shared kind of that journey and the benefits of that. Um, they also shared the challenges of COVID, and Merle gave some insight. She shares, dance was depressing for me during the pandemic. We couldn't go into the studio, and it was via Zoom. I realized that dance for me had a lot to do with togetherness and learning from others, feeding off of their energy. And it was so it was really um, interesting for me to hear participants share not only what they learned on the dance floor, but they really focused on what was happening outside in other spaces. And so for them, it wasn't just about the physical aspects of dance, but it was the togetherness, the support that they received from their fellow dancers, the conversations that they were having. Those are the things that they really missed during the pandemic. However, there was some good. Sonia shares, interestingly, in the pandemic, because there was nothing really to do, I actually started doing these dance videos I found on YouTube, as many most of us might have. And that helped me with isolation, online education, and all of that. So I dance more now than I did before, because I realized that it actually helps me cope with everything. So we not only heard from participants the benefits that they received and that they had during before the pandemic, but even after and during. Theme three, the impact of dance and mindfulness. This is where participants really got to narrow and, and really hone in on all of the aspects of dance and mindfulness programming, such as HDA and the benefits that it's had on their lives. Merle shares, yes, some may see it as just a dance camp, but the first word there is harmony. There's a true sense of togetherness and trust. Let's look at non-judgment. Stephanie shared, I enjoyed meeting people from different backgrounds. It taught me the importance of not judging others. And how about mindfulness? For many of the participants, Harmony was actually their first introduction to meditation and to mindfulness practices. 
And for many, they continue to use it to this day. Stephanie shares, it's a form of therapy that I use today to help calm my nerves, especially in any stressful situation. It allows me to focus on the present and reduce negative emotions or thoughts. So what did we learn? Well, first, participants have experienced and continue to experience gender inequality within the school system and workplace. They described how they're treated differently than their male counterparts and often feeling that as a female, they're not able to make the same mistakes and receive the same grace as others. Two, participants have experienced and are experiencing emotional challenges, whether it's anxiety, depression, or low self-esteem and a lack of a trusted space in which to share and process their truth. As I mentioned, Many participants don't have a guidance counselor at school in which to go to. And those that do don't trust them because there's a breach of confidentiality often. And so they often find themselves with nowhere to turn. And three, participants' experiences reflect the positive impact dance and mindfulness had on their emotional and mental well being. So why do we do all this work? Why is it so important? Um, not only because of how it may benefit the participants and readers, but also because we wanna ensure that there's changes made on the government level. And so I start with recommendations to the government. And I start with the three A's, assess, amend, and act. And while I know it may be maybe second nature, to jump right into action, implementing policies, I think it's important for the government to allow each administration to assess their student body in order to determine what the need is in regards to whether it's talk therapy, movement and mindfulness. Um, I think it's really important because every population is going to be different and their needs are going to be different. Um, and so we must first assess and then we can amend. I think it's also important to note that the Grenada government is not blind to the needs and the issues that they have regarding gender inequality within their system. However, there, is, there isn't much, very little at all, that addresses the emotional well being, especially of young women, and how those all tie together. And last but not, so we must amend, right? We have to amend policies in order to support implementation of actual um, programming. And so we amend and then finally we can act. I also include recommendations to dance educators. There are great dance programming on the island. Um, there's lots of great talent and lots of great instruction. However, or maybe and, Harmony Dance Academy is currently the only program that has a mindful component that is actually intentional about creating a safe space for courageous conversations and really use, utilizing dance as a means to address emotional issues that students may have. And so I recommend that they go beyond the dance steps and really think about incorporating mindfulness techniques as well as a safe space for conversations. And then there's recommendations to the young, uh, young Caribbean women. In speaking to my participants, it was clear that there's a stigma, a hesitation in regards to seeking help, especially when it comes to mental and emotional um, challenges. And so it's so important that you know, when we feel that we need the help that we seek it, as well as finding time to engage in activities that you love and mindfulness. And last but not least, in regards to future research, I think it would be awesome to explore young men and, and how dance and mindfulness uh, are impacting them. In the last few years, while Harmony continues to be predominantly female, we have uh, began to see an increase in male enrollment, which is really exciting. Uh, and I think it's also interesting to maybe take a larger sample size. Um, and I also think that this research 
can be expanded throughout the Caribbean. So whether it's Trinidad, Jamaica, Barbados, I think we can also uh, learn and see some great things there as well. So I thank you so very much. And I leave you with one of my favorite quotes um, for, from the esteemed Alvin Ailey, which states that dance is for everybody. I believe that dance came from the people and that it should always be delivered back to the people. So thank you again, and I welcome your questions. Thank, thank you so much, Vanessa, uh, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I have a question actually I'd like to ask right off the bat, and then uh, we'll open it up um, for questions uh, fr from, from others. I love the title of your your uh, your study, um, especially the part that comes after the colon, the intersection of gender, education, and crisis. As I was listening to you, I thought of another component that perhaps might have played an important role in in your study, and that is the intersection of gender, education, crisis, and culture. How do you think? that your study was affected by the culture of Grenada and how might it be different had you conducted this study somewhere else? Excellent question, thank you. I think you're absolutely right. I think culture uh, fits right in there because it plays such a large part. As we looked at cultural stigma, the role of, um, or the, the stigma around mental health, around emotional distress, um, it plays such a big part. And that was really evident in speaking with the participants. Um, it took, you know, while I, I knew some of, I knew most of them, I knew all of them, um, it still took one-on-one -on -one interviews. So in that first focus group, it was really hard for some of them to really open up and share what they had been experiencing because the norm is to, hold it in, right? To put a smile on your face, to put that mask on. I see some heads nodding. You know, that is how we thrive as Black women, um, especially, um, I think, regardless of where you're from, quite honestly. And so for these young women, you know, who haven't lived and experienced all that we may have just yet, uh, culture just plays a huge, huge part. Um, and it's really what we're up against. Um, and it's not, uh, you know, Grenadian is beautiful culture. And the, the benefit is that dance is a major part of the culture already. So why not infuse what's already there, right? What's already present, what's already embraced um, and utilize that to address this other, this other issue that is often swept under the rug. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, there's a question in the um, chat from Christopher Harden um, asking, can you extend your research to show how dance and mindfulness can improve academic and emotional achievement for females? Absolutely. Um, and thank you, Chris. Shout out to my amazing cohort member um, who recently also successfully defended. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. And in my research for my literature review, um, that's, a, that's already coming to the surface, right? So looking at how dance programming positively affects their grades. Um, in my interview, I spoke with participants. Um, one participant in particular had an interesting outlook because she was a teacher. She, was, uh, she started with Harmony from the very beginning. Um, and was inspired to become a classroom teacher because of it. And so she was able to kind of speak from quite a few different lenses. Um, and she spoke about the difference that she sees in her students when she as a teacher engages them in mindfulness practices. Um, and so she's kind of, she was able to kind of share from both sides. So absolutely, I think there's definitely, there's research done in regards to the benefits of dance programming and academics. However, not particularly, I haven't seen particularly in the context of in the Caribbean and for females. So absolutely. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Okay, I have another one, actually. Um, so I'm as interested in the performing arts. Um, it's a very important part of my life. Um, so I was wondering if you see this extending 
beyond dance into the uh, into other performing arts areas like um, singing, you know, music, th singing, uh, acting, improv, those kinds of things. Great question. Um, while the other arts aren't particularly my wheelhouse, I'm a firm believer that th there's a, a common thread and connection between all of them, right? And so as a dancer, you know, music is, I mean, right there, right? Um, and so I absolutely think that is possible. Um, and there is, you know, there's definitely research out there to support it and the literature out there to support it. Um, so yeah, I could see it. Uh, dance in particular is my wheelhouse, but actually Harmony in, in the last few years, um, you know, we, the program started with 15 young women and our last program right before COVID, we were at 120. And so we started offering different, <laughs> um, thank you. We started offering different enrichments for the students. So you would dance in the morning and then after lunch, maybe you took an art class, maybe there was a vocal class or African drumming or, so we really tried to incorporate those other arts because they're also important. Um, and they all kind of fall into that same vein of really the conversations that we were able to have with teenagers after, <laughs> you know, uh, they've danced or after they had a reflective writing uh, session or, after drumming or doing Taekwondo was just really outstanding. So that that space was there now that I think about it. Okay. And uh, we have another question in the chat box, uh, which will have to be the last question because we're ending our time here. And that is, uh, and this question is from Jennifer McDaniel. And her question is, have you learned any techniques for amending movement slash mindfulness programming so that, um, movement and mindfulness can continue to have positive impact in the virtual environment as it does in, in an in-person environment? Excellent question, Jennifer. Um, another cohort member. Um, what comes to mind is in conducting this research and engaging just in, in the program in the last few years, but I would I would say particularly in the last year, I've had to increase my own practice um, and really become mindful. Um, and so that's that's allowed me to just increase my skill set um, in order to bring it back to harmony. Um, so that's been really, really great and interesting just to kind of see the evolution of my own practice. Um, and then when it comes to online or or in person, yeah, you know, it's really interesting um, conducting the interviews uh, via Zoom, the participants still, you know, they spoke about the challenges they have of, um, of even being in that space or dancing online. Um, and so I think there's pros and cons as we've all experienced with, you know, online versus in person, um, you know, online, you're able to reach so many, you're able, you know, there's more flexibility. Um, however, I think when it comes to personally, when it comes to dance and mindfulness, there's nothing like being in person and sharing that energy um, and being in the same space. So I look forward to it, but I, I've definitely learned a lot. Okay. Hope that I answered your question, Jen. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much, uh, Vanessa. So I would like to thank both Elena and Vanessa for presenting today. And I would like to thank all of you for attending the colloquium event series. Uh, the next and final colloquium for the academic year uh, will be Friday, May 6, uh, between noon and 1 p.m. So I hope everybody has a great weekend. And again, thank you all for coming.